music. It's the love of music that brings us together. The love of music that forms the bond between us. For the next hour, join us for the love of music, presenting those aspects of music which excite, provoke, and inspire. Our host today is David Dubow, WNCN music director, pianist, educator, and writer on music. Here is David Dubow for the love of music. This is David Dubal, and I am very pleased to have as my guest today the renowned pianist Paul Badura who has just flown in from Chicago. His life is actually mostly travel, isn't it? You're in China, you're in South America. You have made perhaps more records than anyone in the world, in a way, because you were at the cradle of the LP. Thanks for coming and talking to me, Paul. It's my pleasure, David. Now, you had just recently played in New York, um, a Beethoven concerto, I believe, with the Beethoven Society, right? Yes, and the fourth. After that, you zoomed away again. And uh, what is this this constant moving? How do you survive this jet lag? These these constant tours. Well, I think of uh, the theory of relativity, and you know, I sit quiet in my plane and I let the world uh, pass underneath. It's very easy. <laughs> It's very easy, but I mean, isn't isn't it tiring as well as easy in the sense of not well, moving? Certainly, it is uh, said that an artist uh, should have the soul of an angel and the skin of an elephant. Yes. Well, and the digestion—I don't know of what of a lion, perhaps. <laughs> do you have those three uh, uh, things going for you? Well, so far I've been blessed with a good digestion, to say the least. Nerves. Uh, are not like steel wires, naturally, we are sensitive people, and that is a handicap, Some, but uh, the skin has grown. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, on our program today, you have brought a brand new record, we never had it in our library, it's on the label Astray, and it's AS80, it's an import, but it can be had here very easily, and it's all Haydn, and we're going to have an unusual program in the sense that we're going to hear the first movement of that sonata, and then we're going to follow it from your recording of Andine by Ravel. So interesting, a contrast. And then we'll go back to that Haydn second movement, which is a minuet, and we'll follow it with, from your same recording of Andine, Ravel, who wrote in honor a minuet on Haydn's name, and then we'll return and finally finish with the presto, those wonderful prestos that Haydn wrote throughout his career. So we're going to hear the Haydn, and before we hear it, you play this not on an instrument that's contemporary, the modern piano, but on Haydn's own piano. This is more and more a thing that is, that is becoming uh, not unusual, right? Indeed. Uh, I would say general taste has switched. Uh, what used to be considered exotic, uh, together with a few friends, uh, like Mr. Demos, Malcolm Bilsom, we were the first one to Absolutely. explore that field. What used to be considered exotic is now accepted as the authentic way to play that music. And naturally, uh, I'm also thinking of people like Len Gould who said that we don't need anymore uh, the very big, huge sound of a concert grand because uh, music can be brought to every living room. And so the delicate, silvery sound of those instruments is uh, seemingly in a way even superior to a beautiful modern piano. Now, the interesting thing is that at first, uh, many people, including myself, revolted from this. I myself am a pianist, and one is trained on a certain piano and a certain sound, and it was the same with Bach. I used to play Bach on the piano, and today I have misgivings when I hear him on the piano. It's interesting. And now this is happening with my listening to Haydn, early Beethoven, some Schubert, I like hearing this instrument. How did you come to this scholarship, this instrument? I know you're a collector of pianos. Yes, uh, first of all, it started, let's see, I was naturally trained to play on the modern piano, and I still consider myself mainly a modern pianist. More than 90% of my concerts are played on modern concert grants. So I started with the condescendence and thinking, oh, these old instruments, they have such a wiry sound, they're just good for museums or for weird uh, people. But then I was converted uh, by two facts. One was a wonderful series of recitals given on a Mozart piano by a Viennese pianist, Mrs. Isolde Algrim, 
And the other fact uh, was even stranger. Having been invited by the London, uh, the Royal Association of Music, to demonstrate uh, Beethoven on an old piano, mm -hmm. contemporary, it happened to be a Broadwood of 1803, and uh, on a modern Steinway, I believed that my demonstration would convince people and myself that the modern piano was by far the better. And the very opposite happened. Everybody wa went out of this session convinced that nothing could match the excitement and the daring uh, felt when you play Beethoven's Appassionata on a contemporary piano, because there you have the feeling the piano might break every moment. Mm -hmm. And you would need a karate pianist to mm -hmm. produce that effect on a modern piano. And uh, just after that one recital, uh, somebody came backstage and offered me a similar piano to that one on which I had made my demonstration. Naturally, I jumped on that occasion, and that was, in fact, instrument number two of my collection. How interesting. So that's how the collection started and that's part of then of, of an evolution in your whole life as a musician. In a sense you said something interesting because the very excitement that the appassionata could break that piano makes a certain kind of tactile um, understanding uh, that you have between the instrument that maybe Beethoven had too uh, that that is is lost on the piano which can sustain it. Am I right? Yes, you are right. It could just fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, and the same happened a uh, generation later, I mean generation after Beethoven, mm -hmm. when Liszt uh, came and conquered the musical world. Uh, the pianos literally broke apart, and there were scenes reported that sometimes he used up to three or four pianos per recital. I'm afraid at these recitals, uh, private homes, he was not invited again. Mm -hmm. Of course, this was still before the, the iron frame. Beethoven never had, I believe, the, the, the metal part that the Broadwood uh, would eventually do give in their instruments, but he, they did send him that uh, instrument around 1819, and it was still wood. So even the Hammer Clavier was, was conceived with the wooden piano in his mind. Right, yes. It's, it's extraordinary because it would seem that these pianos would just break. <laughs> Well, sometimes they do break during the mm -hmm. recording sessions, and you need to have at least one technician to stand by. You're now, obviously, also a scholar and, uh, could I say, a musicologist, not only a pianist. Um, what, what does scholarship really mean? It's a term that is used frequently, and yet very few actually have a definition for it. What is scholarship in a musician's world? It is not easy to define because it uh, comprises so many different uh, facets uh, of knowledge, of knowing about music. Naturally, the first uh, thing, it is like art history. You know the background, the lives of the creative artists, whether they are painters or composers. You know how to undig an unknown symphony, how to go to libraries to find manuscripts uh, or original editions. So musical history is one part of it. Another one is acoustics, the know-how, what really makes music in a physical sense. Mm -hmm. And then particularly important, and that was how I got uh, induced to it, was uh, to know about historical performance styles. Mm -hmm. The practical thing, the music uh, is just uh, a message, it's a, a sort of uh, cable which you have to decipher. And sometimes the deciphering is not that easy. We know of old music, not so long ago, three, four centuries, mm -hmm. which uh, you couldn't read unless you have had a very special training. That's right. Music, then, for the interpreters, become a very specialized thing. One doesn't just uh, say, as they once did, well, if the ornament is confusing, let it alone, forget it. I mean, there there's a whole new scholarship involved in playing the piano. Um, but what also does the word interpretation mean? We, you, you used that a second ago. We're yes, the, the word uh, actually is uh, to interpret languages. To That means to translate uh, from one medium to the other. Yeah. And that's exactly what we are supposed to do. At least it's how I conceive the task of a performing musician. 
to translate the message given by a composer by the means of uh, deciphering what he has written mm -hmm. and understanding the sense of it, that's the main thing. Yeah. And then translate it as it were, for example, to a different sound, to a different audience, to a different century, mm -hmm. unless we play contemporary music. Which you have also, which comes to mind the Frank Martin Concerto, yeah. which was written for you. Um, now, you, we were just talking about uh, the past, though, and uh, how, do you, um, how do you feel about, let's say, going further into the Romantic Age? Do you think that a, a Chopin will eventually be played on pl playels, let's say? Will, does he sound better, too, that way? That's a very interesting question, and up to very recently, I would have probably denied that possibility. I had a feeling that, uh, let's say, starting with Chopin and uh, the later Schumann, what we had was practically identical with the modern grand. But only two months ago, I was invited to make a recording on a Chopin piano, uh, playing the preludes and some mazurkas, and I was struck by the difference. I wouldn't say that it was better or worse, but it was very, very different. I uh, understood better what I had detected from my historical knowledge as a scholar, how Chopin emphasized rather delicacy and phrasing and subtleties. Uh, the Italians have a wonderful word, sfumature, mm -hmm. that means uh, the vapor of music, literally translated. You could uh, feel that the instrument was much clearer in its texture, particularly mm -hmm. in the low register, much less brilliant in the, in the upper register. It had a wonderful transparency and uh, wonderful poetry, particularly when you were playing uh, the slow parts of a Chopin piece. How did the pedal work? Exactly like ours. Uh huh. You felt the same kind of sustaining power. Yeah, but it was, uh, you could uh, easily use more pedal, which, for example, explains Chopin's original pedaling. And could you use more of the uh, unicorda pedal? Did it have a special effect? It did, yes, but uh, not, uh, to, not to any different effect as on a modern piano. Now, again, we've been discussing scholarship and you uh, and Chopin, and, and you have edited music, too, in Chopin's, I believe. I know you have a splendid article in that Chopin Symposium by uh, Alan Walker, I think. Well, my congratulations. You must have done a lot of homework on this. <laughs> I must say that I have done no homework, but that you have been certainly in many musicians' and uh, listeners' lives for, for, my goodness, since 1950, I think you came here. This must be around 30 years. It is precisely 30 years, yes. Yeah. It's my... It's, more, it's not my golden jubilee yet, but it is a jubilee. Well, you're a young man yet as well. Mr. <laughs> Badiraskota, we are going to hear piano of Haydn's period in the 47th Haydn Sonata from your absolutely new recording. It'll be 6 minutes and 33 seconds, and it's number 47, and the artist is Paul Badrascoda. <laughs>
interesting hearing that incisiveness on that piano of Haydn's period, the Sonata Number no. 47 in B minor in the hands of my guest, the pianist Paul Badura Skoda. And right after these messages, we'll be back with more discussion and more music. We will hear, as a matter of fact, a composer quite different, Ravel's Andine. This is David Dubal. My guest is the eminent pianist Paul Badura Skoda, who was in America for a tour. He has had many tours of this country. Do you like America and American audiences? I sure like it. Now, you were born in the city of city for music, Vienna. Now, was that something special as you were growing up? Did you feel that tradition or culture? Of course not. I took it for granted. Mm -hmm. And I, in my young, very young years, I thought that Beethoven, Mozart, and Schubert were still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Their pictures were everywhere. <laughs> yes. Well, Mozart is, of course, a um, uh, very close to you. And as as the LP was was beginning its great course in society, uh, so were Mozart's piano concertos. And you were you were really among the first to record them. Um, did you see the play Amadeus by any chance? Not yet. No. Uh huh. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, I don't know about how the, the music is presented, but uh, it's an interesting psychological study. I would have thought that you so would have seen that already, but you have no time for such things. Oh, not necessarily. I love to go to theaters. Now, you are um, playing this year in China, too? Indeed, yes. After my tour to Japan, I shall spend uh, two weeks in China. They wanted me for much more, but that's uh, the utmost I can afford. Not only uh, to perform probably in Peking, they say Beijing, that's why I was hesitating, mm. and in Shanghai, but also to teach master classes. They are very eager to catch up with uh, the uh, 30 or so years lost uh, being cut off from mm -hmm. Western musical tradition. Now, um, you were in China before? Two or? and a half years ago. And the audiences are good? Very good, very different from what I had expected, because uh, during uh, the last years of Mao and the so-called cultural revolution, nobody dared to show appreciation of classical music. Mm -hmm. uh, that means some Western orchestras and artists came, but uh, the reception was uh, nearly ice cold, uh, that you're feeling uh, to play in empty space. It was totally re reversed. I should say the Chinese are more outspoken, more spontaneous in their reaction than, uh, let's say, the Japanese. Hmm. Now, uh, Mao had said that Schubert, Mozart, uh, and so forth, they, they were dangerous or, or decadent, correct? Yeah, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> Mrs. Mao, uh, during all that time when uh, some member of the Philadelphia Orchestra, when they came, she asked for a private performance of uh, the decadent Beethoven. Mm -hmm. That shows how little. And also, I remember one saying of hers, the piano should be used as an arm for the revolution. <laughs> I suppose you should drop it on the heads of the capitalists or something. <laughs> I don't know how you could elsewhere use the piano as an arm, mm -hmm. as a weapon. Well, it was a great, a great product of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Um, so there's something of the revolutionary aspect in the piano. Uh, <laughs> so you've played in China. You're, you've played in, in Japan. My goodness, everywhere, really. Do you have favorite places? Do you have favorite halls? Do you have uh, things like that? that I do, mind? yes. Uh, I liked very much recently to play in Davis Hall, in the new concert hall in San Francisco, mm -hmm. which I thought was very good. It is uh, rather new and not everybody seems to agree on its quality. And then, of course, one of my favorite halls is uh, at the two concert halls in Leningrad. They, they are, of course, full with a rich tradition in one of them, which is called the Glinka Hall. Liszt performed during mm -hmm. his concert tours. And the other one is, of course, the famous home of the Leningrad Philharmonic. That beautiful hall. Yeah. Beautiful, but the audience, of course, too. They, they, these are the warmest audiences you can imagine. And, and so what do you mean, Paul, warm? I, the, the explosion of applause or just a, a, an atmosphere? An atmosphere. Naturally, there's an explosion of applause, too. But you feel this wonderful anticipation before you get in. You feel 
people holding their breath in order not to lose the most delicate uh, shading in music and you see people with the scores and uh, students and teacher alike to follow everything you are doing it's mm. marvelous to play there now when you played in uh Leningrad. What was the program? Did you play uh, romantic I, music or, or, or <laughs> no? Guess what I played? Mozart. <laughs> uh -huh. And are they are are they feeling akin to Mozart? Because their own pianists don't really, to me, seem comfortable with Mozart. Yeah, I thought they told me that it was a sort of a lesson to them. They are a little afraid either to give too much or too little, and so we have had both uh, extremes in young or not so young Russians as they play what we call in a romantic way with many exaggerations mm -hmm. or in an ice cold way shying away from anything which is personal yes and I try to convince them that you can be romantic without uh, going to the limits uh, without uh, for example to undergo tempo changes mm -hmm. within a movement how very interesting we're going to stop our talk for a second and we're going to uh um, here, Ravel Zandin from Gaspar de la Nuit, very different in all ways from the Haydn we heard. I don't think you could play the Gaspar, the Gaspar on Haydn's piano, could you? No. Or wouldn't want to. Let's hear my guest today, Paul Badiraskota in Ravel celebrated Andin.
You have just heard Undine by Maurice Ravel, played by Paul Badurusko to my guest today. And after this message, or perhaps two messages, we'll be back with more discussion about his fabulous career. Paul Badaraskota is my guest, and today we're hearing Haydn and Ravel. His new Haydn record will be coming up again in a second. You have made so many recordings. Um, do you listen to your own recordings? Do you have any favorites of your own? You were listening while we were hearing the music, and it seemed like you had never listened before to this record. I listen to a recording mostly once when it comes out to convince myself whether it is as good or as bad as I had thought. Uh, mostly it's in between. <laughs> <laughs> and then I put it aside and never listen to my own recordings. I think many artists do it the same way, I'm told. Everyone that uh, I ever ask that question to says very much like that, approximately the same thing. And, and I never understood it. Uh, I would think that you would run home every day. You have a whole record collection by now of uh, probably over 100 recordings. Well, yeah. Amazing. And uh, you could just spend time with yourself. But I guess, I guess you just don't. No, because uh, I know what I intend to do or what I intended. And I'm rather interested to gather new data, to know more from a different uh, artist, for example. How mm -hmm. does he look into that matter? I'm not... A all against listening to other artists perform the same piece. Yeah. Yeah. Naturally, after 20 or 25 years, when I'm shown one of these recordings, which is played to me, I sometimes don't recognize my own interpretation anymore. And this has happened more than once that I was asking innocently, who is that pianist? <laughs> and you didn't know because you have changed. Yeah, sometimes that's that's uh, the typical pianist of the younger generation. You know, mm -hmm. he plays so note perfect. Oh, that's wonderful! It's embarrassing and it's wonderful too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I well understand it. Now, you were, you you grew up in Vienna, as we said before. And uh, did you come to music instantly, or was uh, was there other subjects in your life? I came to music very very early. My mother was not a musician, but she thought to it that I took piano lessons uh, at a very early age. I started uh, before I was six, but uh, that was considered uh, part of a general education, mm -hmm. and it never occurred to me nor to my family that I should become a musician. But uh, poco a poco, uh, my talent was discovered, and uh, people First, it was uncles and aunts said, oh, the boy, he must become a musician. Now, I took it at its face value, you know, uncles and mm -hmm. aunts very easily get carried away. And I still didn't believe until at the age of about 14 or so, I heard uh, the great Edwin Fischer for the first time. And that uh, didn't uh, immediately change my road, my intentions, but made me think uh, twice about mm -hmm. my future. Mm -hmm. You had studied some engineering and uh, mathematics and things like that interested you. Uh, Fisher, you later had master classes with him or did you study privately with him? I had uh, but one private lesson with him. He never gave I private see. lessons. I only the master class tradition. Yeah. Uh, Paul, everyone I've ever asked about uh, Edwin Fisher, they were always awed. I remember uh, very recently Ronald Smith the British pianist yeah. uh, had uh, had a wonderful experience with him, and he he must have been a tumultuous personality as well as a great musician. Yes, Fisher was a very different personality. He had uh, all the bearings of a genius, mm -hmm. and uh, for example, both Alfred Brendel and I agree that he's one of the few uh, pianists who deserve the epithet a genius. Mm -hmm. But genius not means not only just to do something very well, we have thousands of that, but to do it in a very different creative way and in an unexpected way, to find new possibilities where everybody else has investigated and thought that uh, field is exhausted. Yes. And in this way, he was creative. It's also frightening. Really? What do you mean frightening? Well... You come there as a young artist with the most perfect training, with a, what you consider as good a control of the keyboard as anyone can have. You sit down and play, 
And after you finish, he says, oh, that's very nice. And in a very friendly way, he sits down and plays the opening of the same Beethoven sonata for you without any intention to show off, just to explain. And suddenly you go to pieces, you feel that what you have been doing was just a child's uh, work, you know, doing just trying to play the notes, but with no meaning mm. whatsoever. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that was our feeling. You could uh, go to the next room and close your eyes and you could hear within three notes where the Fischer was playing or any of the good pianists and there were the cream of good pianists from all the nations who visited his classes. Mm -hmm. So this, this thing called genius is a magnetic fluid which uh, seems to transform what what one thought was common into something uncommon. Am I correct? Right, you are. He But had something different. He did. Of course, it did not always come through. There were moments of agony in his con uh, concert performances. He was so oversensitive that sometimes uh, it uh, spoiled nearly a whole recital or concerto performance. How do you mean oversensitive? Well... To his, to his own playing? To his own playing or to some little noise in the audience or a person who just uh, uh, coughed uh, in the middle of a slow hmm. movement or whatever there was. He got easily irritated and uh, irritation can show in many different ways. In his way, suddenly he could produce bundles of wrong notes or run away things which are the negative side of being uh, so creative because mm -hmm. nothing was uh, premeditated. It means naturally he knew as well as anybody else uh, work from beginning to end. But when he was carried away and literally carried away, anything could happen from the most divine to the most uh, awful. Mm -hmm. So uh, Edwin Fisher was without a doubt one of your great influences. And I'm going to get back to some other influences uh, that you may have had, but I want to uh, continue with what you were saying, which is uh, he seemed to um, become unfocused with a cough. Now, your career has been worldwide, many audiences. How do you handle audiences? And I'll ask you one other question. Um, are they a disturbing factor or to have a career on, on a grand level as you have, you, you, you have to just accept whatever happens? This is uh, such an important question. We know, of course, uh, Glenn Gould's opinion that uh, an artist would be at best at his recording studio without any interference from the audience. And, uh, of course, uh, you had uh, Vladimir Horowitz, I think, who believes that the audience uh, is necessary and inspires him. Am I right? Yes. I feel yeah. more like Horowitz in this mm -hmm. way. The audience can be a nuisance, indeed, mm -hmm. particularly if you have an audience you don't know yet or where you feel uneasy that you have feeling people are rather turned against you that can happen mm. that's an awful feeling you know mm. and you feel that people are just waiting for the slightest mistake to happen this happens naturally in places where you have too many contemporaries in my home city for example in mm. Vienna mm -hmm. it's the one city where I find it most difficult to perform on the, the other hand time. audiences can inspire you and there is a give and take uh, a mutual inspiration I would say the wave increases at every give and take, which uh, carries you above your ordinary limits and makes you give more than you can give in a recording session or at home. Now, often audiences expect a great deal from the artist, sometimes um, just to be titillated is what they want, and they certainly can drain one. They, they have a hunger. But do you ever expect something from an audience or an ideal audience do you are you upset if you feel they don't know the the schubert b flat or that it's too long for their attention span seldom do we uh do we hear artists saying that the audience was bad the audience usually is saying the artist is <laughs> something or other or the critic is Well, most of the audiences uh, I find very receptive. And I think uh, this is perhaps the secret of a performing artist, to be able to cast a spell over the audience, which is far more than just make the music for them. Mm -hmm. We have seen the same with great actors. And uh, again, coming back to Edwin Fischer and also to some of the great conductors I have experienced, I was very fortunate to hear Toscanini while he was still alive, 
in the early 50s. And uh, before he started to raise his baton, you could feel there was an electrical tension, something great must happen. And this was not because we are geared to it or prepared. It was just this uncanny feeling, something great is there in the air. He had that thing also, whatever it is. Um, we're going to go back to that Haydn sonata on Haydn's own piano, not his own, but you own it now, and it's the minuet of that 47 sonata in B minor, and that will be 2 minutes and 43 seconds, and we will return to talk about more things right after. Now we have heard the minuet movement of Haydn's Sonata in B minor. We began the program with the first movement. We followed it with Andine, and we played the minuet movement. And now, before we even talk again, I think it's a wonderful idea to go to your Ravel album and play Ravel's minuet on the name Haydn. You see, we have some connections here.
You have just heard Paul Badura and the piece, not known, is it? Not really they much known. Little. And it's really programmed today because of our Haydn Sonata, which we're working Ravel around. <laughs> and it's the minuet on the name Haydn, and we will be right back with more discussion of my guest, Paul Badura Skoda. Paul Badura Skoda has played in New York this month. Um, he's been playing all through America. How do you feel about the fact that so many musicians are specialized today into the uh, aspect of the performing of music that uh, once they would have been a composer pianist, and today that seems to, to be on the wane, if not almost a dead issue. Do you get to compose, or did you ever want to? I, you know, I think everyone wants to compose, but uh, to compose is more difficult in our times than any time before. How or come? That is the same like in painting. The artist uh, in earlier societies had his function. He was writing within a framework for a certain need. He knew exactly where he belonged to, what he was supposed to do and what not to do, what was allowed, what mm -hmm. was forbidden. Mm -hmm. In today's art, uh, you have to create your own style. You are not born into a style. You cannot just say, well, I'm writing like Brahms, like Beethoven, that mm -hmm. wouldn't make any sense because it would be just imitation, it would be eclecticism. Mm -hmm. Or in painting the same, you couldn't even imitate Picasso. Right. And that is the, the real uh, crucial thing, to find your own style, to make up your own limits, because art, and actually freedom, can only exist within limits, mm -hmm. within a framework, and that's what is the problem of the creative artist today. And it's a vast problem. Um, Haydn, how would he have functioned in a society like today, which, which is so different than the cushioned environment he had for composing? Think of, did you ever think of such a thing? Of course. Uh -huh. uh, I think, uh, naturally, the, each of these composers would write in a contemporary idiom. There's no question that yes. Haydn would, today wouldn't write like Haydn 200 years ago, nor would Beethoven or Mozart, for that fact. And certainly they would uh, follow the same patterns. Haydn was the one who loved experiments. I could see Haydn doing a lot with electronic music, mm. uh, bringing in, as he did... Uh, at his time, it was rural music or gypsy music, so you could find elements of uh, jazz, maybe even rock, mm -hmm. in his <laughs> symphonies. So that's my idea what Haydn would be today. Oh, that's just absolutely wonderful to think of Haydn writing rock, but I, <laughs> I get what you mean, Paul. Thank now, you. Uh, one more question before we actually hear the finale, that presto, which, which so many finales of, of Haydn are marked presto. He has this this energy that nobody ever had really in the 18th century. Uh, what about uh, at night when you are resting and uh, you have practiced and you have heard um, favorite uh, singers on records or whatever and pianists? Did you ever have the thought of, gosh, would I have liked to have heard um, Bach, let's say, or whatever? Do you have a fantasy of, uh, or a number of artists, musicians that you would like to have heard? If they could come visit you in Vienna and play on some of your <laughs> antique pianos. Beautiful dream, yes. Uh -huh. Beautiful dream. <laughs> well, who would not? Naturally, it mm -hmm. would be Mozart performing on his own piano, Johann Sebastian Bach improvising a fugue, and of On the organ or the harpsichord? Either. Mm -hmm. You yes. don't care, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chopin, of course, playing uh, his, his uh, wonderful nocturnes or preludes. Mm -hmm. Liszt? Oh, yes, very much so. Brahms? Well, I mean, you, I would like to hear every of the great composer performers. I understand. And Paganini, of course, would mm -hmm. be a dream. It seems really he was incredible in, to such an extent that uh, he influenced three generations of musicians. Mm -hmm. And not only by his dazzling uh, skill, you remember that Schubert was supposed, in the last letter, to have said, I have heard the voice of an angel. Mm. Yes, he said something like, I also, like, I only cried um, two or three times in my life, and one was 
one was hearing Paganini. No, I think that was Rossini who said that. I think so. Anyway, uh, I wonder if uh, Heifetz would like to hear a Paganini. <laughs> well, I think he would. I'm sure he would. We're going to end our program with the presto movement of the uh, Sonata Number no. 47 in B minor from your new recording, which is, is it in uh, America now? Can it be purchased here? Oh, definitely so. Well, it's A-S-T-R-E-E, -E, the label, and it's A-S-80, so let's sell one million, like rock <laughs> records. Here is Paul Badura in Haydn. <laughs> just heard Paul Badura in the finale presto of Haydn's Sonata in B minor from his new release on Astray Records, AS80. Paul is now going to God knows Russia, who knows, I mean he's always on the move and thanks for coming here speaking to me today. Thank you, it was a pleasure. This is David Dubal and thank you for listening. For the Love of Music, with today's host, David Dubal, WNCN Music Director. We hope you'll be with us when once again we meet to listen and exchange ideas, all for the love of music. For the Love of Music is produced by WNCN New York, GAF Broadcasting Company.